On the 25th of September, 1888, a legend was created by the author of this letter. He claimed to be the most famous murderer in history and signed himself Jack the Ripper. No one has been able to prove who wrote those words until now. A 120-year mystery has just been solved. Partly thanks to his gruesome nickname, the Ripper was the first serial killer in history to cause a media sensation. Now, former tabloid editor Kelvin McKenzie uncovers startling new documentary evidence and identifies a very different set of suspects. The crooked journalist at the heart of the Ripper legend. This nails the guy who signed himself Jack the Ripper. London, 1888. Scene of the most famous murders in history. These magic lantern slides have left us with a vivid picture of the age when Jack the Ripper terrorised the streets. The Ripper always struck in London's seedy East End. His victims were always the same. They were women, they were down at heel, they had no food, they were drunks, and they all resorted to prostitution to survive. Veteran editor Kelvin McKenzie is investigating how the murders of these anonymous women became one of the biggest stories in newspaper history. My interest lies in separating the facts from the newspaper fiction that surrounds these ghastly murders. What really happened and what was reported? Were they the same thing? The East End today is an odd mixture of trendy bars, curry restaurants and million pound houses. Little remains of the slums that once stood here. But every night in Whitechapel, Crowds still flock to hear the Ripper's gruesome tale. 31st of August, 1888, I shall be telling you about the first victim, Polly Nichols, or Mary Ann Nichols, as she was known. She was a prostitute of 43 years old. Now, that day, she had had many, many customers, but foolishly, she spent all the money that she had earned drinking gin. On this particular Friday night, she had just been thrown out of a common DOS house or low lodging house because she didn't even have the fortunes it cost to spend the night there. From that moment forth, and within the hour, she was doomed. This booming 21st century ripper industry comes as a surprise to Kelvin. It's astonishing that 120 years after these murders, there are crowds of interested people still wandering the route that the ripper is thought to have taken. It tells you that the legend of the ripper has an eternal fascination. At about 3.40 in the morning, P.C. Neal came round by Bucks Road. He swung over his lamp and it revealed the brutally murdered body of a woman. It was Polly Nichols. Her throat had been cut twice, one four inches long and the other from ear to ear. She'd also been slashed across the abdomen. Some of the intestine was protruding. She'd been cut and stabbed in the genitalia area. The killer had then turned his razor-sharp blade and inserting it just above the pelvic bone, he'd cleave through the flesh and the body right to the sternum. The Ripper's first victim was Mary Ann Nichols. The only photograph of her was taken at the police mortuary. Mary Ann Nichols was a nobody, an alcoholic and a prostitute. And everybody would have known that she took a severe risk by plying her trade. So it was rather surprising that the Victorian press would show so much interest in her murder. But right from the very beginning, the Whitechapel murders were a media event because of the sensational efforts of one newspaper. I have in my hands the Star, which was an upstart 
evening newspaper for London, launched actually curiously in 1888, exactly the same time as the Whitechapel murders. No relation to today's Daily Star, this fledgling paper was desperate for sales and quickly found a way to get them. The editor discovered that the more he put in about the Whitechapel murders, the higher his sale went. So, not unreasonably, he started thinking, well, what can I do to make this even more scary? And it didn't take him long to come up with a sensational new angle. The star linked Nichols' murder with the recent violent deaths of two other prostitutes, even though there was absolutely no evidence to connect the killings. Marianne Nichols was murdered in a wholly different manner from the other two, one of whom had been bayoneted to death, probably by a soldier, and the third one had been beaten to death by three assailants. The three murders had nothing, nothing to do with each other. But he tied them all together and said, three murders, serial murder, my God, the whole of East London is being stabbed to death. And what happened? Sale through the roof. Editor, genius. I know how he feels. The star's pioneering editor was Thomas Power O'Connor, whose statue still watches over Fleet Street. Preparing for circulation war, O'Connor wanted his new paper to be cheap and racy. Its target market was the newly literate lower classes. There was a massive explosion in literacy at this period, and reading a newspaper becomes part of everybody's daily life in the way that it still is. And O'Connor is one of the people who manages to, uh, you know, to ride the crest of this wave, really, because he has very astute ideas about what all these new readers will want to read. The Star was a proponent of what the Victorians called new journalism, a more accessible tabloid style of writing what today we call tabloid journalism, but in, in uh, Victorian times was called new journalism, was a very, very recent invention. It's dramatising stories, it's simplifying stories, it's personalising stories in ways that hadn't been used before. The star was the epitome of the new journalism. It was racy, it was sensational, it was written in simple, adjectival language, and it was full of speculation. T.P. O'Connor wanted to hit the reader, as he put it, right between the eyes. And he didn't really care whether the stories were true or not. And with their coverage of the Mary Ann Nichols murder, the star clearly demonstrated O'Connor's scandalous disregard for the truth, even printing a detailed description of their fictional serial killer. There is a maniac haunting Whitechapel. His expression is sinister and seems to be full of terror. His eyes are small and glittering. His lips are parted in a grin which is excessively repellent. They knew it wasn't true, but they were out to sell papers. But strangely, reality was soon to mirror the newspaper's fanciful reports. Before long, a real serial killer would strike. On the 8th of September, 1888, a 47-year-old prostitute named Annie Chapman was found dead in a back street of Whitechapel. Mutilation to her abdomen suggested she had been killed by the same man as Mary Ann Nichols. Just a few days earlier, the Star newspaper had printed fictional reports of a serial killer. Could it be that their sensational fabrications had actually now come true? Former tabloid editor Kelvin McKenzie is heading to South East London's old operating theatre to examine the evidence connecting the Nichols and Chapman murders. Forensic pathologist Professor Derek Pounder has studied the original inquest reports. With the help of a life model, he is going to demonstrate the killer's methods in both murders. So, Professor, what are the similarities between the Chapman and the Nichols murders? Well, two things. First of all, 
how the victim was killed because the evidence from both is the throat was cut and secondly the mutilations to the body after death. For the first killing of Nichols, the post-mortem incisions uh, after he'd cut her throat, he's made about three of them or four to the one side. And then on the other side, at right angles, he's made three or so there and then he's made a really deep one lower down which has exposed the bowel. What were the mutilations in the second case? Well, in the case of Chapman, we're not sure precisely where he made the incisions in the abdomen. We know the abdomen was opened and we know he's removed the uterus. We can suppose that what he's done is made an incision from here, just below the breastbone, all the way down to the pubic bone and then spread open the abdomen. Both murders involved a violent attack on the victim's genital regions. With the second crime, the killer went further and made a trophy of the uterus. He was taking the internal organs and walking from the crime scene through the city, having the internal organs with him. What he has is a fusion between violence and sexuality in his mind. So what you see in the crime scene is a living out of his sexual fantasy. If you were the pathologist of the day, having seen the similarities of these killings, would you have said, yep, this is the same person who did this? Yes, that has to be the presumption. These were very unusual killings in the way the body was mutilated after death, and it had to be the same person. If the killings occurred today, we'd be looking at it as a serial killer. Well, that was very interesting. I had always presumed that these violent sexual killers got their drive out of the murder. Actually, it was the mutilation following the victim's death. That's where the murderer was getting their kicks. That was really quite horrendous, to be frank. The murder of the second victim, Annie Chapman, had occurred in the middle of a media storm. So this killer was clearly undeterred by the press. Perhaps he even relished the attention. There was so much publicity after the first killing we have to ask ourselves, was the publicity actually driving this killer onto new victims? Suddenly, every newspaper was writing about him in this kind of excited, attractive, enticing language. It's a serial killer, no one's safe, and it's almost as if it could encourage someone to strike again. The star made the most of the second Whitechapel murder with sensational reports of Annie Chapman's injuries. The woman having been ripped up from groin to breastbone, the viscera had been pulled out and scattered in all directions, the heart and liver being placed behind her head. She was covered with blood and lying in a pool of it. The Star newspaper ran all the gruesome details, even down to one headline saying that the heart and the liver were over her head. And the Victorian buying public? They couldn't get enough. Star will have details about the removal of organs, details about throats slashed. We don't see details like that about murders that are committed today. The knife was jabbed into the deceased at the lower part of the abdomen and then drawn upward, not once but twice. The first cut veered to the right, slitting up the groin, but the second cut went straight upward along the centre of the body and reaching to the breastbone. Death was part of everyday existence in a much more immediate way in Victorian times. Whatever reason, it comes as quite a shock to see quite how graphic some of these stories are. And why on earth anyone would want to read them over breakfast beats me. We need to remember, of course, that for most people, it was still within living memory to go and see public executions. These were almost a form of entertainment at the time. The average Victorian reader had a much higher uh, gore ratio, if you like, than the typical person today. The Star wasn't the only paper cashing in on the Whitechapel murder story. Such gruesome killings were a godsend for circulation figures all over Fleet Street. And if there's one thing Kelvin knows about, it's boosting newspaper circulation. Kelvin edited the Sun newspaper for 13 years, 
and has designed many a multi-million selling front page in his time. See how big you can get that? As big as you like. Today, with the help of graphic designer Eddie Koshegua, he's composing a ripper front page to investigate the links between modern tabloid style and pioneers of new journalism, like the star. There's no doubt that the headline remains a massively compelling part of the commercial sell of a newspaper. A headline works at a number of levels. If it can make your reader smile or slightly recoil, um, uh, then you have achieved a good trick there. Papers which practice new journalism, like The Star, had already begun to understand the importance of eye-catching headlines. The Star really gets into the great sort of headlines. The murder maniac sacrifices more women to his thirst for blood. Now, turn over to the Times of its day, which was a very stodgy offering, look. Yeah. With one headline saying, another Whitechapel murder. So, there's no doubt which one you're going to pick up. Yeah. Kelvin is drawing from original Star articles to create his own headline. I heard a cry of murder in a faint voice. This is a neighbour who had overheard yeah. the killing of one of the uh, Ripper victims. I think we should go for that, don't you? Put a big quotes around it. I heard a cry of murder. The neighbour tells it all only in the star. The star had already begun to use illustrations to bring its stories to life, but hadn't yet understood the power of a front page image. But Kelvin's not making that mistake. Today he's using authentic Victorian etchings to create his front page. Not that. Where's, Where's the next? Yeah, there's the one. fella. Yep. This one here, because he's thought to be with one of the victims there. This is supposed to be the very second that the Ripper knifed a victim. He's got the dagger in his hands, he's got his hand around the throat. Um, yeah. That's pretty compulsive stuff. And, by the way, makes some rather more interesting front page than uh, T.P. O'Connor managed. T.P. O'Connor trumped by Casey McKenzie. Read all about it. That's the front page. Print it. All the national newspapers covered the Whitechapel murder story, but the star was to take things one step further. The star needed a suspect that would keep the Whitechapel murders in the news. They went looking for a popular angle, and once again, they weren't too bothered about the truth. The star made a shocking move. They decided that the killer must be Jewish, and the reason they did this is because there was a feeling against the Jewish community in the East London area, and this is what they said. He is a Jew or of Jewish parentage, his face being of a marked Hebrew type. There was actually no evidence. There was a rumour and they injected anti-Semitism into it. It was a disgraceful moment in journalism. Just like their serial killer angle, the star's Jewish theory turned out to be a circulation winner and other newspapers swiftly copied it. This was the popular press pandering him to anti-Semitism, to xenophobia, to hatred of foreigners in a way that we can see parallels now today. In fact, one newspaper said no Englishman could have committed such a crime. It had to be a foreigner. It's this thing of turn on the ethnic minority when you can't think of anything else to do. Sir Charles Warren, the commissioner of the Met, said at one point that uh, the Ripper was probably Jewish, probably a socialist and maybe both. <laughs> This was an ideal way to sell newspapers for them. So they went through the suspects. It had to be a Jew. And if it wasn't a Jew, perhaps it was an Irish man, the next best thing. Or other ideas said a Malay, high on opium. Another one was a Portuguese soldier, because it was thought that Portuguese were prone to mutilation. The majority of nationalities in London at the time were blamed for the murder, because it couldn't possibly be a, a nice Englishman. The star called their Jewish suspect Leather Apron. 
borrowing a nickname local prostitutes used to describe a particularly rough hunter. The story helped it to reach the massive daily circulation figure of 300,000, less than a year after its launch. But it also nearly got them into a costly libel suit when Leather Apron turned out to be the nickname of a real and entirely innocent person. So this guy, Leather Apron, actually existed. His name was John Pizer. He gets furious, round to the star offices, grabs over the crime reporter and says, you give me 50 quid, otherwise I'm going to sue you. Out comes the 50 quid. Now, this is 120 years ago. This was quite a lot of money. At that, Mr Pizer disappears, and so does the story. For several weeks in September 1888, the killer lay low. The news desks were quiet, reporters were idle, and editors were anxious as they saw their sales plummet. Then on September the 27th, a letter addressed to the boss arrived at the Central News Agency, an organisation which syndicated news stories across the world. It claimed to come from the killer, and for the first time, reveal the name that would become legendary. Kelvin is consulting historian Andrew Cook to find out more about this sensational document. Here we have a copy of the so-called Dear Boss letter. And this is the letter which, for the first time, actually says Jack the Ripper. In fact, it says, quite politely, yours truly, Jack Absolutely. the Ripper. Absolutely. Well, in fact, they start off here Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police had caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I am down on whores, and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. My knife's so sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. God, that's a gruesome payoff. It is an amazing thing for a murderer to sign themselves. A tremendous sort of taunting. They've merged together Jack, which is a classic name, Spring Hill Jack character, who was a Victorian bogeyman character at the time, and Ripper, which obviously, you know, encapsulates an aspect, a key aspect of the murders themselves. So combining the two, you've got a very powerful, evocative name. The reality is that were it not for this amazing name, Jack the Ripper, these murders would have been lost in history. But before his new name is made public, Jack the Ripper will strike again. And this time, he'll claim two victims in one night. At 1am on the 30th of September, 1888, Elizabeth Stride was found murdered in Whitechapel. The third victim of a killer we have come to know as Jack the Ripper. 45 minutes later and less than a mile away, a second victim, Catherine Eddowes, was discovered by the police. This killing spree would come to be known as the double event. Kelvin McKenzie is visiting the scenes of both murders with veteran crime reporter Martin Brunt. This is the very street where Elizabeth Stride was murdered in a revolting manner. What do we know about her and how she was killed? She was originally from Sweden, uh, a woman in her 40s. Uh, she was the Ripper's third victim. Unusually, her body wasn't mutilated. She was found with her throat cut, but there was none of the ripping, in a sense. The, there was no removal of any of her internal organs. So Elizabeth Stride is murdered, but she is not desecrated as a person, as the other victims. What, what could possibly have been the reason for that? Well, the theory is that the killer was disturbed and he wasn't able to satisfy that bloodlust because he goes on within an hour 
to find a fourth victim where he does go berserk with a knife. We're coming up to Mitre Square, where this vile murder of Catherine Eddowes happens. What was so repulsive about this murder? Catherine Eddowes was found in the street. She'd been slashed across the face. The killer had really ripped her. He'd taken out her uterus. He'd removed one of her kidneys. So the scene that confronted the police was as gruesome as it gets in terms of the Ripper's attacks. So within an hour, two women are now lying dead on the streets of London, less than a mile apart. How big is this story now? The story that nobody thought could get bigger has suddenly got even bigger. But I think it would be more difficult for the crime reporters then to cover it in the way that I would cover it. In those days, there wasn't that kind of established relationship between the police and the press. So reporters either had to find their own contacts or bribe police officers. And reporters going around getting all these witness statements before the detectives caused confusion and further alienated the two groups, the police and the press. But so desperate were they for clues, the police allowed the publication of the Dear Boss letter. Soon, the whole country had heard the name Jack the Ripper. You can imagine the effect that that must have had on this growing mass of newspaper readers. Suddenly, this mysterious killer had a character. He was Jack the Ripper. I mean, manna from heaven for the headline writers. And, and the, the whole issue of these murders became the Jack the Ripper murders. I mean, how many rippers have we had since then? We've had the Yorkshire Ripper, the Suffolk Ripper, the Camden Ripper, because that is such a chilling soubriquet to attach to serial killers. The killer's new name helped newspaper sales to skyrocket. And the police began to wonder if the letter which christened him was actually the work of an unscrupulous journalist. What I feel quite sure about is that uh, whoever wrote the Dear Boss letter wasn't the person who killed those women. Um, because it's just too perfect, I think, really. It's exactly what a newspaper editor would want to work with. Police suspected a man from the Central News Agency but never had any proof. The author of the letter remained a mystery, but the real murderer lost no time, living up to his new Ripper nickname. On the 9th of November, inside this building, a cheap lodging house known as Miller's Court, the body of a young woman was discovered. There was such a slaughterhouse in Miller's Court. There is a horrendous mutilation uh, 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 over the body, completely uh, different scale to the other killings. The body was eviscerated, the face slashed beyond recognition, the breasts were cut off, the internal organs removed. It was just totally horrific. The victim's name was Mary Kelly. She was a 25-year-old prostitute. After her murder, much of the press coverage was devoted to speculation about who the killer might be. Having exhausted the foreign possibilities, newspapers rushed to the scandalous conclusion that the Ripper was not only English, but posh. The first suggestion was a decadent aristocrat. It was likely to be some toff going east who was slumming or looking for a prostitute. There was a lot of interest in aristocrats with fruity private lives. The idea that the murderer was a high society gentleman and his silk top hat immediately made it more newsworthy because these men, they were celebrities of their day and the idea that they had been involved in such a brutal, gruesome, squalid murder was a brilliant story. The gentleman angle was particularly popular with papers like The Star, whose readers came from the lower classes. It tunes in, within a way, the radical agenda of much of the reporting, that this is a story about the exploited poor. These women who are his victims are right at the bottom of society. So the idea of an upper-class killer is only one more form of exploitation. <laughs> And newspaper speculation didn't end with sketched-out impressions of top-hatted suspects. 
Next, the medical profession came under fire. The second suggestion was that it was a mad doctor. There was some debate about whether any medical knowledge was required in order to execute these mutilations. It was supported by an editorial in The Lancet that says, yeah, the kinds of hysterectomies, in effect, that were performed upon two of, the, of his victims needed medical expertise. Doctors themselves fell under suspicion, and one poor man, when he was walking around the East End carrying a doctor's bag, he was almost lynched and had to have police protection. So more thanks to the press than to hard evidence, our time-honoured image of Jack the Ripper carrying a doctor's bag and wearing a top hat was established. Over the following century, a long list of real-life suspects have also been named and debated in the newspapers, most of them conforming to one of the popular stereotypes, a Jew, a gent or a medic. At the bottom of the social ladder was Aaron Kosminski. A Polish Jew, off his head, and um, uh, as far as I know, that's the, the only evidence they had against him. Then came John Druitt. An Oxford graduate and a barrister whose career was going nowhere, threw himself into the Thames. And after he committed suicide, there were no more Ripper murders, so that's one of the reasons why his name has become appended to, to these crimes. The impressively mustachioed Francis Tumulty also entered the frame. Francis Tumblety, an American quack with a huge collection, apparently, of pickled uteruses. He was also homosexual, and in those days, anyone who was responsible for homosexual practices was looked on as a pervert and uh, fair game for being a murderer. And in later years, famous names like the artist Walter Sickert fell under suspicion. One of the most ridiculous theories is that a man who painted some murky images of what appear to be dead women in rooms in London can only have painted those images um, if he had actually carried out crimes that would have produced uh, dead bodies lying in murky rooms somewhere in Camden. Higher up the social ladder, even Queen Victoria's personal doctor, Sir William Gull, was suggested. I gather that he was both aged and hemiplegic by the time the murders took place in the late 1880s, so how he got around, I don't know. People have suggested that he must have had an accomplice, because this wasn't the kind of man who could rush around the back streets of Whitechapel, pursued by the police and others. Even those at the very top of the tree could not escape speculation. Prince Albert Edward, the Duke of Clarence, the Prince of Wales' son and, and Queen Victoria's grandson, He's been in the frame. He was a member of the royal family who was unbalanced and uh, also did have um, interesting sexual proclivities. And it fitted this idea of the, the toff, the mad aristocrat. You can't get much madder than uh, the royal family. The evidence against all of these men is weak and, in some cases, non-existent. But headlines were made every time a new suspect entered the frame. And it's still happening, 120 years after the crimes took place. In November 2008, Broadmoor Hospital released the medical records of a patient called Thomas Cutbush, and a new suspect hit the press. Proof of it were needed that over a century later, Jack the Ripper can still make headlines. Kelvin is visiting the News of the World offices to meet the paper's editor, Colin Myler. With over 25 years of tabloid editing between them, they should know why the Ripper story still has legs. These are today's papers. Mm. 120 years after multiple murders, Jack the Ripper still makes news. Why does the Ripper still fascinate? Because it's unsolved. Simple as that. There is this almost unquestionable thirst for a murder mystery. There was a fascination to find out who was he, and in five and ten years' time, they'll still be writing the stories, and it'll be in the news of the world. What do we owe to the Star and other popular papers of its time when it comes to today's journalism? What this story did at the time for papers like the Star was it smacked you between the eyes. It shocked people, and it became populist. It was the readers moving the circulation dial in huge numbers, so they gave them what they wanted.
And that was the start of the real tabloid newspaper. And down the years, popular newspapers have continued to live by the saying, if it bleeds, it leads. Anything that is more than one murder, that has serial attached to it, that has sort of gruesome attached to it, that has mutilation attached to it, and yes, blood, gory, mystique, mystery, is going to sell. Every time they put crime on the front page, it sells. And in 1888, the Ripper's crimes definitely sold. So just how far were the Victorian press prepared to go to keep his story on their front pages? It has long been suspected that a journalist was responsible for writing the Dear Boss letter, which had first used the legendary name Jack the Ripper. The letter had been sent to the Central News Agency, an organisation which syndicated news stories around the world. It was argued that only a journalist was likely to know about such an institution. If this is true, Kelvin is determined to uncover the culprit's identity. He's hoping Andrew Cook's research into the Star newspaper will at last reveal the truth. This letter I found is from the major shareholder of the Star newspaper to the new editor in 1890. This previously unseen document suggests that senior figures at the Star knew one of their journalists, a man called Frederick Best, had sent the Dear Boss letter to Central News. There's a fantastic line in here, which is unbelievable. Furthermore, Mr Best's attempts to mislead Central News during the Whitechapel murders should have led to an earlier termination of his association with the newspaper. Basically, this nails best as the guy who signed himself Jack the Ripper. This is the face of Frederick Best, the man behind a 120-year-old mystery. His photograph has never been shown publicly before. Who was Best? What do we know about him? I think we know quite a lot about him now. Um, we know that he was effectively a jobbing journalist. He was somebody who was sent to crime scenes really to pick up human interest stories. He would have had a very good uh, insight into the Whitechapel murders because we know that his wife, Henrietta, was actually born in Whitechapel. So through her, through his in-laws, as it were, he would have had, I think, some very good connections in the neighbourhood. The fact that the star's main shareholder was fully aware of Frederick Best's forgery and writing a letter about it suggests the journalist was unlikely to have been acting alone. What this means is that within the star, they knew full well that Best had written this incredibly problematic letter. And what I can't understand is why they didn't deal with it, why they didn't boom him out the door or go to the police. And it must make you think that actually, quite a long way up the ladder, he was being protected. And the only person that, from my experience of this kind of thing, could protect you under these circumstances would be the editor, O'Connor. So was T.P. O'Connor, the star's pioneering editor, the man behind the biggest newspaper hoax in history? Twenty years after Jack the Ripper terrorised the streets, former tabloid editor Kelvin McKenzie and historian Andrew Cook have had another breakthrough in the case. Andrew has found a sample of handwriting from the journalist Frederick Best, their prime suspect in the Dear Boss letter forgery. He and Kelvin are keen to have it compared to the Dear Boss document itself. They hope to answer the question of whether Best was acting alone or if his celebrated editor, T.P. O'Connor, also had a hand in the hoax. They're going to see the former chairman of the British Institute of Graphologists, Elaine Quigley. She has examined the Dear Boss document many times over the years, but never in regards to the Star newspaper. Until now. Elaine, thanks to Andrew's super sleuthing, 
We've got examples of Fred Best's handwriting from his estate. Mm -hmm. And we have, obviously, the Dear Boss letter. Indeed. You've studied it. Is there any similarity between these? I've found quite a few. The way the um, letters are formed, both in Fred Best's letters and in the uh, Dear Boss letter, has a lot of similarity indeed. Elaine is placing an acetate copy of the Dear Boss document on top of Fred Best's handwriting samples to identify similarities in the lettering. If I put the N over the M, which Best has written, it fits exactly, it just settles neatly over. So mm. the stroke, if you look at the stroke, it mm. comes up yeah, it does. absolutely the same. Mm. There's lots of others. That is an S there. Identical. Don't they fit beautifully? And then if I want to do something with a, an ordinary T, I can match it. It fits exactly. The general handwriting style of the Dear Boss letter also makes Elaine suspicious. The whole point about this letter is that it doesn't have any signs of aggression or tension or a person who is out of control, who could start ripping up a body, and there's no energy in this writing. It's all copybook, like someone has written it down and copied it out so it would be absolutely perfect. There's no personality in it. Even the immortal words, Jack the Ripper, don't impress Elaine. This signature is extremely um, basic and exactly the same as the text. It's a very sort of staid and boring piece of writing. What does that mean to you, then? Jack the Ripper was a guy who was doing these amazingly horrible things with panache, you know, ripping out parts of people and all the rest of it. And here we've got this rather plebeian, pedestrian, very simple copybook Jack the Ripper and he can't even get the Ripper correct because he's almost missed off the R. If he really was Jack the Ripper, it would be Jack the Ripper with a great big flourish. Because that's the whole point of this letter. It's it, a boastful, exactly. it's a chest-beating exercise. So yeah. I am Jack the Ripper. But in fact, he seems to have forgotten halfway through yeah. who the hell he is. Indeed, he's got no identification with this whatsoever. So there's no doubt in your expert opinion that the Fred Best letter, which came from his estate, yeah. his family, and the Dear Boss letter were written by one and the same person. I'm, I'm as sure as I can be. I really don't think that it's anyone but Fred Best that's written this. And Elaine suspects Frederick Best was not working alone. I don't say that Fred Best was the only person. I think he was copying something that possibly someone had written for him. If he'd written it himself, I think he'd be more engaged with it like anybody writing out a hundred lines and they're, they're just doing it because they're doing it, not because they identify with the lines they're writing. And that's what this seems to be. The shareholder's letter has already indicated that the editor, T.P. O'Connor, was aware of his employee's forgery. Now, Elaine's analysis suggests that the hoax involved more than one person. This backs up Kelvin's belief that nothing would have been done without the approval of the star's boss. I think it's absolutely fantastic. A 120-year mystery has just been solved. This letter was signed, Jack the Ripper. He wasn't the killer. He was a journalist. And not only that, he wasn't even a great journalist. That letter was clearly written for him. He just copied it out. So the man I salute in all this is his boss, the editor. He left behind the greatest headline in over a century, Jack the Ripper.